Hallelujah. So we want to begin a very critical series. A series that is so critical that uh, we are hoping that the lectures that will come from this series will form a major component of your Christian life in the name of Jesus Christ. Uh, before I begin, I want to speak through the um, cameras to all our partners all over the world that have been fiercely in support of our gospel campaigns. The Lord will increase your greatness and he will comfort you on every side. In Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Turn your Bible to 1 Corinthians chapter 21. 1 Corinthians chapter 21. Sorry, not Corinthians. 1 Chronicles. 1 Chronicles. Are you there in First Chronicles? Right, so 21 verse 18. I'll begin a little reading because I need to show you a certain dialect that undergirds all of our processes of priesthood if it's going to gain the acceptance needed for a response from God. Then the angel of the Lord commanded God to say to David that David should go up and set up an altar unto the Lord in the threshing floor of Onan the Jebusite. And David went up at the saying of God, which he spake in the name of the Lord. And Onan turned back and saw the angel and his four sons with him hid themselves. Now Onan was threshing wheat. And as David came to Onan, Onan looked and saw David and went out of the threshing floor and bowed himself to David with his face to the ground. Are you there? Okay, where are we now? Verse 22. Then David said unto Onan, grant me the place of this threshing floor that I may build an altar therein unto the Lord. Thou shalt grant it me for the full price that the plague may be stayed from the people. And Onan said unto David, Take it to thee and let my lord the king do that which is good in his eyes. Lo, I give thee oxen also for the bond offerings and the threshing instruments for wood and the wheat for the meat offerings. I will give it. And the king said unto Onan, Nay, but I will Verily buy it for the few full price, for I will not take that which is thine for the Lord, nor offer burnt offerings without cost. I am attempting to explain the now altar. I will begin with an elementary definition and then I will continue with more complex definitions as we advance in the study. For now, 
I'd like us to understand that an altar is a metaphor that symbolizes sacrifice. An altar is a metaphor that symbolizes sacrifice. The dialect that spirit beings understand, the dialect that they can relate to it, the dialect that they can respond to is the dialect of sacrifice. And as we journey in scriptures, you are going to see how this dialect is used to catch the attention of spirits. It will interest you to know that when we talk about altars, we are using it in the broad sense, not just because as we study, we will differentiate between righteous altars and evil altars. But whether it is a righteous altar or an evil altar, it is a metaphor that is used to symbolize sacrifice because that's the dialect that spirit beings can understand. And it happens to be that David is, is well trained in the area of priesthood because his mentor happened to be Samuel the prophet. We're going to study the life of David and you are going to see his attitude towards the Lord. And then you realize that there was an understanding that he had that gave him the advantage and gave him the ability to move the hand of God even in very critical circumstances and in critical situations. This is the wisdom that David manifested. He was offered everything that was needed. There was a catastrophe in the land. And the catastrophe that hit the land was because the government led by David decided to do something with the authority of the throne that was contrary to prescription. Are you there? It's just like the budget, the 2024 budget has just been passed. I don't know how many of you have taken time to look at the budget. Anyone here, you took some time to look at the budget? Well, I advise you to take some time to look at the budget. Because if our planning and strategy is supposed to be our means of advancing our economy and, and bringing us out of the waters, then the viability of our budget is a strategic tool to predict whether or not it has the capacity to bring out of the current economic situation. Are you still following me? Or I should leave my economics alone. My wife is the economist. I'm not, I'm just a lame man. But I've worked with figures for long. And if figures have meaning at all, then I assure you, not as a prophet, I assure you by, by the power of numbers that I've studied, within the environment of the budget, I can tell you, I can predict that nothing of economic advancement will happen this year. Because I've taken a very critical look at the budget, <laughs> and the budget is not designed to solve any problem in 2024. Now, that budget has been passed. It's now a legal document. It's a legal document that can be used to collect money from Central Bank of Nigeria and disburse according to the prescription of the budget. But because the budget is amiss, the entire land is going to suffer from it because it's an act of government. Are you there? So David used the authority of his throne there was a policy of government that he initiated that was contrary to the will of God. The consequence of that policy was nationwide. So if the devil wants to afflict the people, all he needs to do is to manipulate their government. And their government will come up with policies that 
Are you there? That will bring them into reproach. So that is what David did. Unfortunately for David, the impact of cash, the, the number of casualties that resulted from his seemingly innocent policy was so much that he had no justification to give another decree if he doesn't find a means to salvage the situation. Thank God he had a prophet that still had the Lord's ear, prophet God. And prophet God was able to see into the realm of the spirit and saw how that the angel was killing people, plundering people, afflicting people all through the land and saw that the angel when he arrived at Onan's threshing floor, he stopped. So he now gave a prophecy to David by reason of the word of wisdom. And said, if you set up an altar in Onan's threshing floor, you will restrain the authority of this angel. So based on that wisdom, they were going to Onan's threshing floor. When they got there, because the man too operated the gift of the discernment of spirit, he saw the angel and he took over. So when David came, he came out of his hiding place to talk to David. He was willing to give David the threshing floor. Willing to even provide the oxen for the sacrifice and probably meat offering, part of his wheat. He wanted to gather onto David so that that sacrifice can be offered. Because everybody was, including himself, they were living in fear of their lives. So if my threshing floor plus some of my bulls and wheat harvest will stop this plague, then I am most delighted to be a donor of such sort to end the plague that is in the land. And David, even though the situation was critical, there was pressure on government. There were several things he learned about priesthood that played out in the way he went about fulfilling the instruction that came from the prophet. He knew that the dialect that spirit beings can understand is the dialect of sacrifice. So even though it was offered to him for free, he knew that if he offers what was given to him for free, it will have no vocabulary in the realm of the spirit. Are you there? It will, it, it will sound like wind, without voice, without demand, without petition. He said, no. Even though I, I appreciate your generosity, um, I will not offer unto God that which cost me nothing. So it means David has a spiritual knowledge and he knows that it is only that which is sacrificial that will be able to attract the attention of a spirit being. An altar, therefore, this is an elementary definition. We will still give many, many, many definitions as we journey. But this definition will set the stage for understanding the protocols as we advance in the study, and it will be easy for you to comprehend the scriptures that will be bringing forth in this regard. So an altar is a metaphor that depicts sacrifice, and sacrifice is the dialect that spirits understand. All right, come with me again, still studying the life of David and trying to bring perspective trying to set the coordinates. In 2 Samuel chapter 23, I will read from verse number 15. Still talking about David's understanding of the subject of sacrifice. David's understanding of the subject of sacrifice. And David longed and said, Oh, that one will give me drink of the water of the well of Bethlehem, which is by the gate. 
And the three mighty men break through the host of the Philistines and drew water out of the well of Bethlehem that was by the gate and took it and brought it to David. Nevertheless, he would not drink thereof, but poured it out unto the Lord. Let's get his comment. And he said, Be it far from me, O Lord, that I should do this. Is not this, he's talking about the water. Is not this water the blood of men that went in jeopardy of their lives? Therefore, he will not drink it. You know, I told you David was trained by a prophet. He longed for water to drink. That was his village, the well that he drank when he was a small boy. Now, because of political crisis, the Philistines were now in occupation of his village, and the well that he drank was no longer accessible. And David longed. And he said, oh, that one will give me drink of the water of Bethlehem. It was a legitimate longing. What I drank when I was a small boy, is it possible for me to drink it again? It was a personal longing. It was not giving the, the soldiers marching orders. And the soldiers took his personal longing to become marching orders. <laughs> it will interest you to know that it takes five years to train a legionnaire. A legionnaire is one that is competent in the use of the sword and the shield, which is a basic attack and defense equipment. It takes five years to train one that knows how to coordinate with sword and shield effectively. But it happens to be that the period that David was running away from Saul, which is the time that he assumed occupation of Cave Adullam, was 12 years. So in these 12 years, they were training for battle, and they had no opportunity for a fight. So when they heard the longing from David, they converted it to be a battle cry. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> when they, I, I don't want to describe that fight because it's, it's difficult to, to, even, to even imagine it. Three guys going against 2,000 because that's what a garrison is. And, and as, the, as the three guys are fighting, then the two guys will now be blocking one guy. He will now fetch water. And the moment he holds that water, I can no longer fight effectively because it will spill it. How they accomplished, I don't know how they did it, but they brought the water to David. David cried out and said, it is an abomination for him to drink that water. Because in the eyes of the spirit, are you there? That water has been transformed. The quality, of, the value of that water is equivalent to the effort that was put into it to get it. So David called that water blood. May your eyes be open to see where normal mundane things take on a different value because of what was put in to secure it. That's the reason why. You know, are you here? Are you, you are not with me. You are not following me. Once upon a time, someone that was into prostitution business brought money to church. You don't want to hear me. <laughs> the value of that money is equivalent to the effort that was used to get it. Are you, are you there? So the Lord cannot receive that one because the value it has is only a demonic altar that can receive that offering. You are not with It's still money. Oh my God. It's still money. But you see, prophetically, the effort that was put in to get it now determines its value. As we go on in the lecture, after I finish doing definition of terms, which will take a few days, then we'll now start talking about a righteous altar. That's when you will discover that someone that got money, big money from prostitution, cannot put it on a righteous altar. But wait, let's get there first. Then you'll find out, hallelujah. Now, the question I want you to ask yourself and answer is, what if David drank it, that water? Okay, you are not, you don't think that way. You only think one way. 
And I'm asking you now, what if David drank that water? I hope you know. Even God doesn't have, accept human sacrifice. You don't know that one. Ah. Um, the man on the console, find out from my online audience, because they normally say that I should not stop sermons because of the, of the congregation. Ask them if they know that God will not accept human sacrifice. Ask them first. When, when you give me the feedback, then I'll continue. I will know that I'm no longer preaching to you. It's them that I'm preaching. <laughs> Abraham was to sacrifice his son to God. And at some point, God stopped Abraham from the actual sacrifice. When he saw that in Abraham's heart, he had released the boy. So in between the time the boy was released from his heart and the actual sacrifice took place, God said, stop. I've received the offering from your heart. But because I don't sponsor, my altar is not an evil altar. It's not capable of taking human blood. So the, the, the aspect of that your sacrifice that requires the actual blood, let's, let's leave that one out. On the strength of that which Abraham did, God blessed him. Are you there? So in our journey too, we are going to see the altar of the human heart. Then I will show you that this human life in order for you to live this human life adequately, you live it by altars. There are many altars that must be built in your space. Give me time. Let's do the basic definition, the broad strokes explanation, then we'll now build it into human life. Are you with me? And the day you now sleep with a woman that is not your wife, you will discover that you have raised an altar. And demons will make reference to that act until that position is adequately restituted. There are so many, in fact, this, the issue of altars are not just natural in the realm of the natural. I will take you to the book of Revelation and we do a little exploration. And you will see that even heaven operates by altars. I will show you a few altars in heaven. Take one and explain that one and how that altar operates and why heaven is like this. Then you will study the remaining so heaven and earth operate by altars. The man said, be it far from me to do this. It's not this, the blood of men that jeopardize their lives. This is the blood of men that jeopardize their lives. He poured it onto the Lord as a libation. Why? Because he knows that the spirit realm understands the language of what? Sacrifice. If you got it to that point, I will take you again just one step further. Just one step further. And this one step further, is, it will require us to jump into 1 Peter chapter 2. 1 Peter chapter 2. He said, wherefore, laying aside all malice and all guile and all hypocrisies and envies and all evil speakings, as newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the world that ye may grow thereby. And if so be that ye have tasted that the Lord is gracious, to whom coming as unto a living stone disallowed indeed by men, but chosen of God and precious. Then he hits the point. This is a revelation. He says, ye are lively stones. And guess who is talking? It's Peter. 
The one that got the revelation of Jesus, and on the account of that revelation that he got, Jesus called him Stone. Later, he had gotten more insight, and he discovered that God's spiritual building that he's building happens to be a holy priesthood, and the material he uses for the building are lively stones. So he could say with boldness that we are lively stones. Don't have time to probe the word lively in that presentation because the emphasis is not God's building. So when we talk about God's building, we are going to probe into the word lively. And when we probe into the word lively, you will now discover that one of the presentations of the word lively is precious stone. So, this building that we are talking about is not built by stones that came from the query site. Sedimentary rocks. This one is built by precious stone. When we talk about God's building, we will need to do a very lengthy lengthy uh, module on the God of diversity. Then you find out that I am different from you by constitution, by conformation, because if you are building and you are not using, if you are using blocks, the blocks are the same size, relatively, all right? So it's either you put full block or you put half block, or you put quarter block because the blocks are the same size. The patterns in which the, the blocks are going to be cut to fit into the building are already known patterns. But if you are using stone to build, no stone is the same size. No destiny is the same size. No purpose is the same size. Now, the kind of building that God builds gives room for the understanding of specificities. Because the kind of design that you can do with, when building with stone is dependent on the stone's size and the stone's shape. It is a very complex process to build with stone. So when we talk about God's building, and God's building is the church, then I will be willing to take us on a journey using the navigator of the Greek word that was translated lively. That's when we need that word, not today. Are you there? All right. So the Bible says that ye as lively stones are built up into a spiritual house and holy priesthood. The purpose of this holy priesthood, which we are, is in this service that we render, the service of offering spiritual sacrifices. You are not with me? Are you with me? Peter calls us a holy priesthood. And the object, the purpose, for which we are called the holy priesthood is so that we can offer up spiritual sacrifices. I just defined to us that, um, I just told us that um, sacrifice is the dialect that spirit beings understand. Now I'm showing you in the New Testament that we are a priesthood, a priesthood that is built on the principle of diversity because we are lively stones. And the reason why God is taking pains to capture our uniqueness in the building is because he wants to reap a holy priesthood. And for the purpose of this lecture, we are not going to look at the reason why the word holy is there for now. Let's just see it as priesthood. When we talk on the issues of a righteous altar, we'll bring all those other aspects into it. Are you there? 
So a holy priesthood. And the purpose of this holy priesthood is to offer up spiritual sacrifices. That's where I need to do some clarification quickly. Because the fact that there is a sacrifice doesn't mean that God will accept it. The only sacrifices that our priesthood are designed to offer are sacrifices that are offered which will be made acceptable to God because they were offered by the help, by the prescription of Jesus Christ. Are you there? You are not there. So the singular purpose for which we were set up as a priesthood is so that we can offer up spiritual sacrifices. Now, so we need to define what exactly is a spiritual sacrifice. Because that is what we are set up to make available. To make available. Spiritual sacrifices. Spiritual sacrifices. In order for me to define spiritual sacrifices, I will still need to introduce another scripture. Or, or maybe let's do it this way. Where is Pastor Mike? I saw him just now. He has escaped. He's offering spiritual sacrifices. Okay. So, Pastor Mike, maybe we'll get some response from the congregation. You take a mic, microphone. Anybody's face you like, give them the mic. Now, the reason why I need to trouble you in this lecture is so that I can be sure that you understand it. This lecture is supposed to form a major aspect of your life. What is a spiritual sacrifice? Yes, bro. What is a spiritual sacrifice? Okay, can you rise on your feet? Let's be asking you some questions. How are you? What's your name? My name is, praise the Lord. My name is Polycarp Sondudo. All right, Polycarp. Um, Polycarp, when you were growing up, who paid your school fees? My dad, my parents. Okay, your parents paid your school fees. Now, I need someone that someone else paid, paid, paid their school fees. No, so, Polycap is not qualified now. Anyone here that someone else paid your school fees apart from your parents? Okay, we have someone at the back there. Let's hear from that person. Please, what's your name? My name is Sangi Solomon. What? Solomon, sir. Solomon. So Solomon, who paid your school fees when you were growing up? My cousin sister. Your cousin paid your school fees when you were growing up? Yes, sir. Um, was she wealthy? Not too wealthy. A police officer. A police officer. So she, she really made sacrifice to pay your school fees? Yes, sir. Right, so. When she was a constable. She was a constable. Constable is someone that is rankless or one rank? One, one rank. R rankless, sir. Rankless. Who can give us an idea of the take-home pay of a constable? As of then, it was around 45,000. So she was earning 45,000 naira. And in my own opinion, that's not enough for me to survive in one month. For just me. But she was earning 45,000 naira. And from that 45,000, she's putting some aside and using it to push him to school. Can you see that she, she, is she still alive? Yes, sir. She's in Makodi? No, sir. Where is she now? She's currently serving in Nakwai Bom State. Nakwai Bom State? Yes, sir. What rank is she on now? She's inspector. An inspector? Yes, sir. So you can imagine a constable earning 45,000 and ensuring that Solomon goes to school. Can you see that it's, it's a sacrifice? But that sacrifice wasn't a spiritual one. 
It's a sacrifice nonetheless, but not a spiritual sacrifice. The, the man that knows the impact of the sacrifice that she has born is Solomon standing here. So the one you squander on will always know. Now Solomon is a big guy. But no matter how Solomon rises in life, if he's a reasonable person, he will always pay homage to that, his cousin, and probably train her children, if her children are in a situation where they don't have anybody to train them. He's already indebted to her, even though he's not saying it, because he knows the circumstances under which he was sent to school. It was not as if she had enough for herself, but in the midst of her lack, she made sacrifice to see that he, he passes through the walls of an institution. Is that, the, is that the truth? Yes, sir. All right, so you can give the mic. So this is a physical sacrifice. When you offer up a spiritual sacrifice, a spiritual sacrifice... <laughs> The person that you are lavishing that sacrifice on is God. And just like Solomon cannot ignore his cousin that was perpetually sacrificing on him to get education, the spirit being that you are lavishing the sacrifice on cannot forget who is bringing the sacrifice. The spirit being will feel indebted to you. The spirit being will feel committed to you. So, the question goes again, what is a spiritual sacrifice? And if you know one, you can give us an example. Having understood that the language that spirit beings Understand is what? Is the language of sacrifice. Now, don't answer, don't answer quickly. Someone here, maybe you were part of a witchcraft court before you gave your life to God. Please don't be ashamed. We want to extract some information from you. You were part of witchcraft before. Don't be ashamed. Hey! You already see, see them now. They are. Is there anybody that was part of witchcraft before in this congregation? A wizard. <laughs> See, the response is not, it's not supposed to be laughter. Anyone that has practiced, before you gave your life to Christ, you did some business with the devil. We're not trying to put you on the spotlight. We're not trying to say you are a bad person. We're just trying to pick some things from the practice that you did. And then I will use it to explain some other things. Yes? Anyone did business with Satan before? Please, help us. Okay, stand up. Why are you? Okay, before you stand up, sit down first. Before you stand up, I hope if you talk, it won't cause you any problem. Okay, so, I'm high with the microphone. Now, listen. Give us your name. Tell us where you are, the local government you are coming from. So we will know. We already have a, an idea of what is obtainable. Praise that, God. Hallelujah. Um, first, it was not directly, but I have a full knowledge of it. Knowledge of it. Of okay. my grandfather. Ah. I forgot to ask you the real question. That who is here, whose father or grandfather <laughs> did business with Satan? So at least her grandfather did some business there. So can you give us some insight? Because in what are the things your grandfather would do in order for him to please the spirit he's serving or to be able to gain audience? from the spirit that is serving. Do you, do you know what it does? Please help us. Okay, my name is Queen Iverian. Yeah, so that's Sister Queen, she's married. So don't, you know, when people use the mic, they're on the spotlight. 
and people that have been praying and fasting, <laughs> the person is normally highlighted. So for your information, this one is, is married. So for 12 years. For <laughs> She's, she's 12 years gone on the path of marriage. So, the Lord give you understanding. Okay. I'm from Gray West. She's from Gray West. And, uh, uh, wait, where are the two people here? In terms of the concentration of witchcraft, is the intensity, the intensity of witchcraft, is Gray West among the sensitive areas? Yes. Okay. Ah! Yes. <laughs> Okay, so we'll have a full story now. Please help us, bring us some. Okay, sir. Um, I remember very well because anytime during the holidays I visit the village, I share the same room with my grandfather. So, um, so you are a favorite child of your grandfather? I'm actually the first. Oh, you're yeah, the first? Yes. Okay. My grand child, yes, sir. So um, there were times he could take chicken or maybe there will be a specification black white colored and all of that some they will strangle and pour strangle. blood some strangle to death and pour the blood yes sir some they will um um i don't know the swa. Let, let us please someone should watch swa like some they will they will pierce Mommy, alive. Quite, what is swa swa Okay, some pointed instrument. Okay. And just kill it like that. That we kill it with that instrument. It. Yes. Then some they will take part of either the goat or the bird or whatever it is, take part of it and live on the altar. On the altar. Yes. Like if you In order for you to gain air time before that altar, something that is alive, we need to lose this life. Once that has been accomplished you have secured the attention of the spirit being. That's what I'm saying. Are you there? You know, we are going far and we have time. So I'm taking you step by step. I don't want to jump. We'll just be moving step by step like that, day after day. And by the time we have done like 20 days, you will know what it takes to set up an altar unto God, the kind of altar that God can accept. The thing is this. No man was designed to operate without an altar. No man. And if you have seen people that have served Satan very well, the ones that have delved in, if you go there with the gospel, they are likely to tell you that you can preach to their children and their wife. True, sir. But don't, worry, don't bother about preaching to them. I don't know why they say that. But I hope I will find out. Because we've, we've gone to different places with the gospel. The Baba will say, preach to the children. It's okay. But for him, this is where he's going to die. In order for you to secure audience, you'll be securing audience with the life of something that was supposed to be living. That is the only way you can secure audience. Yes, go on. So he said there are some parts of some animals, some birds that can be taken and the spirit likes to see them. If you have gone that far to take the heart of a bird, it means the bird died. You present it. In fact, my grandfather's name, special name was a bird. They call him a Ingbiututu, maybe like Now Monishu. someone help me. Someone help us <laughs> with the English name of that, of that bird. Mommy Akbar. You know, when you see someone that can speak thief language without English, mixing it with English, those are the people that know the real... Like if, you say, if you say who? Uh, kings, you speak thief language. It's English that is, that, that is speaking. It's, it's a common... Uh, but uh, personally, I don't know the name. You, okay, you don't know the but English. But all of us know it. It's, uh, it hovers around the environment. It's brown with a black tail. It oh. makes a sound. Hood, hood, hood. Oh, <laughs> so that was the spiritual name of your grandfather. I, I think so because they hear him like they hear him with that, that name. Uh, but those elderly people, those were the name they held. 
they heal him with. In fact, in a, you know, this thing, they use it to uh, kind of pray over you to get uh, bad luck. <laughs> so if they want to you to labor in life. <laughs> Please help me tell your neighbor that life is supernatural. So, well, that, yes, go on. To agree with that, there was a particular day in the evening we were in the house, in the, at the village then. Some people ran in the house that um, they killed a particular young man and it, he was, it was not a death agreed by the um, community. So the person who did it was to bear, carry the death on his head. So hey, then, wait, 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 you are becoming... You know, there are people in, in America listening yes, to us. Yes, sir. Be saying it so that they, they can hear. Because if you are in London walking on the streets, what we are saying now, Looks like, hey, what, what are these people talking about? But you know what? Trust me. I have a gift. I can, if I start praying here, I can tell how difficult this atmosphere is. Right? The first time I went to London, it took me 12 hours of prayer to break through the atmosphere. Even the atmosphere of my village was not as powerful <laughs> as that of London. Oh, you are laughing. Because someone in London now will think that he's abroad. <laughs> he doesn't know that he's in the womb of witchcraft. And that's why we are going to spend time to really walk through this teaching on altars so that everyone that is under the sound of our voice will take responsibility for his life and for his destiny. Yes? So there's something the thief called Kehe. The thing is, I'm not very old. Maybe I'm saying this thing, some of you will feel I'm old, but no. My grandfather lived very long. He died at the age of 110. That was 2010, 14 years ago. And we're very close. So I know these things, like, I know them very well. So when they killed him, there's something called Kehe, so they now, if you kill someone and um, you don't want the person to die again, they will, I don't know how they would do it, so it will, you come back to life. So when uh -huh. they do, yes. Wait, wait, wait. wait. Yes. You kill a human being. Yes. And then they don't want him to die again. Yes. They do that thing, then the person will come back. Yes. Can you bear witness to that? What? Uh, those of you listening to us online, <laughs> we are transmitting live from <laughs> Benue State. Um, may the Lord give you understanding in Jesus' mighty name. So what did they do to the young man? Did they, did yes, they... that is what I'm, I was trying to agree with mommy what she said. So they came. And the name they called, I think that was the first time I heard that in Bill Tutu. So later he was now just me that it's only when there's a serious case they call him that name. So he was the only person to reinstill that dead person back to life. So he was he, the only one that had the technology. Yes, and which he did. Uh, yes. Okay, okay. Now, in fact, that is an advanced testimony. <laughs> Over and above what is required for my lecture. But... We, we, we will come to that, we will come to that as we progress. Should I tell you something? If you are skillful in the way of altars, you can change almost anything. Almost. Almost anything. You can change almost anything. So as we build it, as we build this lecture, we'll give us some practicals to go and do. And then you will notice, you will come back with stories. You come back with testimonies. What we want to do is to equip everyone with the knowledge of how to move the hand of God. Let God no longer be a story that you tell, but a reality that you can command deliverance by. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. So as we progress, we also look at um, the personal level of altars, the corporate level of altars, 
and the community or national level of the practice of this kind of priesthood. Uh, thank you, Sister, Sister Queen. Now, you see, like I said, when we talk about spiritual sacrifices, it comes out of a knowledge which is drawn from participating with the Spirit. When you participate with the Spirit, you get to know what the Spirit likes. Are you there? You get to know what the Spirit does what? Likes. And then anytime you want the attention of that Spirit, you make that thing available. When you make that thing available, it's a spiritual sacrifice. In the natural, that sacrifice may not have any meaning. But the implication of that sacrifice is more spiritual than natural. Now, um, Solomon's cousin paid his fees. That's a natural sacrifice. And that sacrifice that she made is, why, is the reason why Solomon is educated today. So you can see the result of that sacrifice in the natural realm. But when we talk about spiritual sacrifices, it is drawn from the knowledge that is acquired when interacting with a spirit. Do you realize, therefore, why you can be ignorant in several things but not in priesthood? Because your skill in priesthood is drawn from the knowledge you have contacted from the spirit being that you are serving. If you are not the one that personally secured that knowledge, you can also use knowledge that is gotten from people, other people's experience. That's the reason why we listen to other people's messages. We, we follow the faith of elders. There are a lot of Christian elders in this nation and beyond that I am close to. The reason is because my own experience is limited. As you can see, I'm a young man. But you see, in terms of spiritual knowledge, I'm not as young. Because what has come through my own personal intercourse with God is combined with what I was able to extract. There's a lot of capacity building that is required to raise a priest. Because your success in priesthood is going to be based on spiritual knowledge. You need to know what the being likes. You are not with me. You, will need, you need to know what the being wants. And if you want to secure his attention, you make exactly that available. The Bible says that God intends for us to become a priesthood. And the object of our priesthood is to deliberately offer up such spiritual sacrifices that is acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Now, I want to take you on one more step. Oh, I think my time is up. Let's take one step. Do you allow me to take a step? All right, let's go to the book of Isaiah chapter 53. Isaiah chapter 53. No, before we do Isaiah 53, can we go to Hebrews Hebrews, 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 Hebrews. Let me get a scripture from Hebrews. I believe it's Hebrews chapter 9. Yeah, Hebrews chapter 9, verse 14. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 13. Then we'll do Hebrews chapter 9, verse 14. If you get verse 14, then we can take my last scripture. I will do a little explanation and then we'll pray together as a congregation. Tomorrow, I'm going to continue from here and take and give us little mileage, little mileage. I'm still in the definition stage, little mileage. Now, by next week, we should enter into um, the personal, the science around personal altars. I begin to tell you how to set up a personal altar, what to expect what you will see, what you should pray for, and then the feedback that you are going to begin to get from the Holy Ghost. Are you still with me? So stay with me. All right, for if the blood of bulls and of goats and 
ashes of a high effort, sprinkling the unclean, sanctified to the purifying of the flesh. Next verse. How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot unto God. Now, please stay with me. That scripture is too heavy. He said Jesus, in order for the offering up of Jesus to be accepted unto the Father, that offering was done through the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost was the one that that guided the hands of Jesus as he offered himself unto the Father. You know why? Are you with me? I say, are you there? It was the Holy Ghost that, that guided his hands because the Holy Spirit knows what the Father wants. So the Holy Spirit gave prescriptions to Jesus on how he should order the process of his death. And the description of how his sacrifice was, was that it was a sacrifice that was without sport. It was lacking in nothing. So the only way a sacrifice will be lacking in nothing is if it is prescribed and guided by the Holy Ghost. I will bring this element of compliance into the practicalities by the time we begin to explore deeper. But please take note of this scripture. Because that blood, where is the man on the keyboard? Let me see if I can find something in the spirit. Now, because that blood is a result of an offering without spot unto God, it has the potency, it has the power to purge our conscience from dead works to serve the living God. That's the reason why the blood of Jesus is efficacious. It came, it resulted from an offering that was spirit guided. And so it is, re, re, it is regarded as an offering that is without spot. Having understood this, you can now come with me to Isaiah chapter 53. We are still talking about spiritual sacrifices. And I will not be able to give you a working definition of spiritual sacrifices yet. I'm just showing you how spiritual sacrifices are achieved. Then by the time we come for the lecture tomorrow, I will now give you an all-encompassing definition that will establish you in the knowledge of this truth. If you are still with me, say amen. amen. Okay, having understood that, let us go to the book of Isaiah chapter 53 as I attempt to round up. Isaiah chapter 53 gives us a picture of the impact and the implication of a spiritual sacrifice. He said, who has believed our report? And to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed. For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant and as a root out of dry ground. He had no form, no comeliness. And when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. This was how the Holy Ghost guided him to offer himself. The Bible says that he was, he was a root that sprang forth out of dry ground. How many of you have seen tender plants before? How they need soft soil to break forth. The Bible says Jesus was like a root that sprang forth out of dry ground. It means the world really was not expecting him when he came. People were not praying for him to come when he came. People didn't want him when he came. So when he showed up, things were difficult for him. He was like a root that sprang forth out of dry ground. As he was being offered like a sacrifice, as a sacrifice, sorry, 
after they finished caning him with the Roman scourge, and they were showing me different ways by which the Roman scourge is made. The tail of a horse. You put it in gum. This latex that you get from mango. And then you break bottles and put it inside. And allow it to dry. So when they flog you, it will go around you. Then they will now draw it. It will go with your flesh. So it will produce stripes. After they finished flogging him, the 39 stripes, the Bible says he had no, no comeliness, no form. His form was, was mad. You couldn't tell where the nose was or where the eye socket was. And when we shall see him, the Bible says there's no beauty that we should desire. It's the Holy Ghost that guided him to offer himself like this. Next verse. He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows acquainted with grief. My pain in that scripture is the word acquainted. It means he suffered and suffered until he became used to suffering. And we hid as if we are faces from him. He's despised, he was despised, and we esteemed him not. So it, it took the office of a prophet to reveal to us the significance of that sacrifice. And that's what he begins to tell us in, in the next verse, which is verse 4. Surely he had borne our sorrows. Now he's now revealing that what he suffered was not for himself. It was a sacrifice that was going to register in the realm of the spirit as spiritual value. He had borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. But, next verse, he was wounded for our transgression. He took a prophet to to show us the impact of his wounds in the realm of the spirit because this is a spiritual sacrifice. He was wounded but for our transgressions. He was bruised but for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him and with his stripes we were healed. Before I finish the lecture, I want to ask you, what is the difference between currency and value? Currency and money. I know we have a CBN staff here. Maybe you help us with that explanation. What is the difference between money and currency? Okay, let's, let me simplify it. What is the difference between money and Bitcoin? You all know Bitcoin? Who can tell us? No, no, no. She's already hiding, so leave her, leave her. Don't put her on the spotlight. Bitcoin. Bitcoin. Okay, someone wants to help us. What's the difference, bro? The difference between money and Bitcoin. Uh, money is uh, the... Uh, sorry, I... I just have a light to throw on the currency. Okay, go, go, go for currency. It's the embodiment of money. Currency is the embodiment of money. I don't believe that. I don't believe that. Uh, one more contribution before I go on. Yeah? What is the difference between money and currency? Because Bitcoin is currency. But Bitcoin is not money. Yeah? Okay. The I'll... reason why I'm asking this question is because the Bible says he was wounded for our transgressions. It means that... Okay, go on. Yes? Bitcoin. Bitcoin. Bitcoin coin is a digital money. It's digital money. Can you explain what you mean by that? You can't... You can't... Physically, you can't hold it. Physically, you can't hold it. But online, you can use it to transact. Okay, let me help you. 
physically you can't hold it. That's what I want you to, wanted you to say. So I give you 70 percent. Physically, you cannot hold Bitcoin. But Bitcoin has a value that you can use for purchase. Are you following? But it's not tangible for you to hold and say, I have 2,000 Bitcoin in my pocket. The fact that it's not in your pocket doesn't mean it doesn't have value. The fact that it's not in your pocket doesn't mean it doesn't exist. The fact that it's not in your pocket doesn't mean it cannot be quantified. So the Bible says he was wounded. That wound, huh? it translates to a value in the realm of the spirit. A currency like Bitcoin. That is what was used. Is that currency that was used to, to pay for our transgressions. Just like you can use Bitcoin to pay for your hotel room. I saw one hotel in Dubai that accepts Bitcoin. So I wanted to talk to Philip B. Let's... Hallelujah. You can use that value to pay for the hotel. Now, if you travel the way we do, I've discovered that there's something called traveling miles. Anybody knows miles here? Yeah? So for, for any trip you make, you earn miles. When you earn enough miles, the way Philip B has earned, you can use those miles to pay for your next ticket. It's not money that you can put in your pocket. It's not tangible, but it is a value that exists. Spiritual sacrifices produce spiritual value that you can use to pay for things. You get that? So he was wounded. His wounds produce a value. It is that value that is used to pay for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. His bruises produced a value. It is that value that is used to pay for our iniquities. The chastisement he suffered produced a value. Is that value that was spent to secure our peace? How many of you know that peace? That peace, this one, this one inside. There's no money in your pocket, but it's there. Anytime you sense that peace, remember, there was a payment that was made in order to secure that peace. The chastisement of our peace. It was upon him. And with his stripes, those stripes he took on his body. Are you there? It translated to value in the spirit. If you want to operate in healing ministry, you must acquaint yourself with the value in the spirit that those stripes created. That is what is used, what was used to pay for our sicknesses. And no matter how you like a commodity, you don't pay for it twice. He paid. He paid for me. He paid for me. I wake up sometimes and look at myself in the mirror and what I, what I may see may not be so exciting, but you know what? He paid. <laughs> he paid and Satan has no jurisdiction because he paid. I'm going to show you how currency is, is accumulated in the realm of the spirit on the account of spiritual sacrifices that are expended. Oh my God, in a moment of time, can we rejoice in him because he paid? He paid. We were destined for hell. We were, we were rebellious. Heaven had concluded our destiny that the only thing that we were good for was utter damnation. But there was payment. There was payment. Even though we hid as it were our faces from him, he was not comely to look upon. We never knew it was our payment that he was struggling to achieve. Can you spend a moment of time and give Jesus wonderful worship from your heart? Because he paid. He paid. He paid. For he was wounded for transgressions. He was bruised for iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes, 
we were here. With his stripes, we were healed. Hallelujah. I want to show you one scripture quickly. Still Isaiah chapter 53. Go down to verse number 9. Isaiah 53, verse number 9. We are going to take the teaching step by step so that everybody will understand. And he made his grave with the wicked and the rich in his death because he had done no violence, neither was any deceit in his mouth. Yet, it pleased the Lord to bruise him and to put him to grief. So God kept bruising him to make up for our failings, to make up for our insufficiencies. To make up for our disqualification, God bruised him. God made his soul an offering for sin. And he kept doing that until he saw his seed. He said, and he shall see his seed and shall prolong his days. And the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hands. Eleven. He shall see the travail of his soul and he shall be satisfied. So if there is a matter, the priest knows the sacrifice that he needs to offer in order for him to satisfy that spirit. That's what we came to study. He shall see the travail of his soul and what? He shall be satisfied. So when you say you are offering up a spiritual sacrifice, you need to know the spirit you are offering it to very intimately. And you know what will satisfy him. The moment he is satisfied, that matter, that matter has been solved. We want to pray before I sit down that the Lord will labor over us and grant unto us the needed spiritual knowledge for the current contentions that is facing us right now. I came to tell you that there's an answer to sickness. There's an answer to poverty. There's an answer to disease. There's an answer to curses. There's an answer to afflictions. It is the priest that brings answers. And during the course of this lecture, that the Lord will be gracious to us to give us the spiritual knowledge that will inform the practice and the dimension of our priesthood. Can we talk to him in a moment?